Good evening, class. I hope you're having a blessed day today. Today we are jumping into topic number six. We're going to be dealing with a laid down lovesick bride. And we got a lot of additional resources on the website. So if you go under your participant tab and you just grab the additional resources PDF, you can download that. It'll give you some definitions, get a lot of additional verses. So I encourage you to go and get that today. If you say, hey, what's that? What are you talking about additional stuff? Well, there are certain things that we don't teach in the curriculum that maybe we've taught previous quarters, or maybe there's just a lot of additional information that I wanna add in specifically to the participants of the class. So if you wanna take this class, I encourage you to get the curriculum. You just go to blankslateministries.org slash store. When you order the curriculum, it'll auto-enroll you in the class and you'll get access to the participant tab. So I encourage you in that. But we're gonna be talking about a laid down lovesick bride. And I have a full explanation of the testimony back in the first quarter of this year, so I'm not gonna re-go through it again. But when we wrote the advanced curriculum, we wrote the advanced curriculum based on the revelation of a laid down lovesick bride. Every piece of what's inside of this curriculum is based off of what God did in my personal life last year. That's why we talk about all of the Song of Solomon, John 13 to 17. The Song of Solomon progressions, love of God. I mean, the fullness of God is what God took this ministry into last year. And this is where we have stayed ever since. But one of my best friends, I love this girl, she said, Jesus is coming back for a laid down lovesick bride. And it's that revelation that kind of, I don't know, jump started me, pushed me, it took me into this, to, to this revelation of God. And so we're going to unpack what a laid down lovesick bride means. It's three different aspects, one being laid down, two being lovesick, three being a bride. And this is not just some cool little phrase. This is a lifestyle. This is a choice. This is what you are before God. You are a laid down lovesick bride. And when Jesus comes back, he's coming back for this specific revelation to be in your heart and for you to be operating in this in the fullest extent. So we're going to go through this lesson. But the aspect of laid down has two different meanings. One is the way in which we lay down our will, live sacrificially before God. And the second one is the aspect of rest. Now, we got a lot of additional resources that we're going to be going through. So just please make sure you have your additional resources. Um, make sure you have that handy. But let's, uh, let's just jump right into the lesson. I'm going to pray, and then we're just going to get started. So, Father, I thank you. I pray you bless everybody under the sound of my voice. Let the word become wisdom, revelation, and the knowledge of your Son. Spiritual seed sown, producing in our body, mind, will, and emotion, transforming us by the renewing of our mind, conforming us to the image of Christ, growing us up in the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. God, we love you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Open your curriculum to page 47. We're on laid down love, sick bride. Let's start here. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? Now this is a powerful passage, but let's start by doing this. What is laid down defined as in this passage what does it mean to be laid down what's this passage referring to laid down would be defined as our sacrificial living to give our lives for our brethren as christ did for us this is the first aspect of laid down laid down has two different facets and the first facet is the way in which we lay down ourselves for others meaning the way in which we live sacrificially are there degrees living a life laid down? Are there different degrees? It's yes. It could be as simple as giving money or resources to giving our time and service even when it could not benefit us, but the greatest of sacrificial living is the point of death, meaning I will die for you. It's the greatest demonstration of love that I gave my life for my friend. And that's what Jesus did. Jesus went all the way We've said it all the time, but Jesus never went 50-50 with you. He only went 100-100. And he went to the point of death. He gave up his life. That's what we're talking about when we talk about laid down. 
The first aspect of being laid down is the aspect of laying down your will and living sacrificially before God and living sacrificially towards others. You know, it says that a righteous man will swear to his own hurt and change not. And when it says that, it means that if I tell you I'm going to do something, I will go all the way in doing it, even if it means that it hurts me in the process. I got great examples of that when I went to do my conference last year, when we held our faith conference in 2022, that I had already committed to another pastor to help serve him and help serve with him in an outreach event. Well, I needed to be passing out cards and promoting the conference and, and, and doing work for our conference, yet I had already committed. So even though it was taking time away from my ministry, I upheld my word to that man and I went and served at this outreach event. And that's, and that's what laid down is all about. It's, it's about living sacrificially, the way we give our time and the way we give our money. But it's to the maximum degree of the way we lay our life down for others. The word laid down, Strong's G 5807, means advise, appoint, bow, commit, conceive, give, kneel down, lay aside, down, or up. Meaning that I give everything of me to the Lord's will. The same way Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane surrendered his will is the same way we surrender our will. We let the plan of God come to pass in our life no matter the temporal circumstances that affect us because of the choice to walk in obedience. A lot of people will follow God because all they know about following God is prosperity, money, healing, miracles. And I, and I believe all of those things are true and all of those things are good and they will happen in your life. But the minute it turns to declension, the minute things start to go downhill, the minute you know you start to become persecuted and, and they... You know, the greatest level of persecution you could ever face is martyrdom, meaning that you die for what you believe. And there's so many people that will live for God only when it's going right. But the minute something doesn't go right, then they're offended at God. And they get offended at God, and then they change their attitude on why they serve the Lord. I serve God sacrificially. I laid down my life as Christ laid down His. I surrender all of me for all of him and that requires obedience obedience to the point of death is what it's referring to you have to go all the way and I don't hold back when I say things like that because if I say you have to obey God and then I say it to a certain point then if it's greater than that you don't believe that you have to obey you have to obey God even to the fullest extent and the fullest extent of obedience is Standing for truth and standing for the Lord, even if it costs you everything. So that's what we talk about when we talk about degrees of being laid down. But the first real facet that we need to understand is that being laid down is about surrendering ourselves to Him. Now there's a second aspect of laid down. Let's talk about this. Let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into His rest any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest. As he said, I have sworn in my wrath that they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise. And God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again, he limited a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. There remaineth, therefore, a rest to the people of God. Now, what is the second aspect of laid down defined as here? Let's talk about the second aspect of laid down. The second aspect of laid down would be to cease from your works as God did from His. 
meaning we move from a works mentality, old covenant, into the new, into the new covenant. That's what it's referring to. We, we take ourselves out of the works-based mentality and we lay down and rest in the new covenant. What, why did the people of the old not enter into rest? Rest is referred here to rest of the new covenant, which Jesus declared on the cross. It is finished. This was reserved for a later time than them. Meaning that the people of the old covenant couldn't rest because that rest was appointed for a time later is when Jesus went on the cross and died and enacted the new covenant in his blood. This is where we rest, where we are delivered from the works of the law and we enter into rest. Let us jump into some additional resources. We have, I have two verses here that I just said, this versus this, so I guess we'll read both of them. James 2, we'll start in verse 14. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Now, hold your place there. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. It says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Laid down, referring to rest in the natural with no work, referring to the way we submit ourselves to God. Now, let me... Let me be able to reconcile the two truths of Ephesians and James. Ephesians says that you receive by grace and not of works. But in James say, you need works with faith. And some people would say, well, what is it? Is it works or is it faith? It's both in a certain context. When James refers to works, he's not referring to I do it to earn from God. That's the old covenant. The Old Covenant says, I do this, and then God does this because of what I did. But in the New Covenant, God already did it, but it doesn't mean that I don't have to do anything. What James is referring to, that faith without works is dead, meaning that when you say something, when you say you have faith, you believe, you trust, yet you don't back it up with corresponding action, then it's dead. There are people that say, well, I trust God financially, yet they don't pay their tithes. And I'm not saying, I don't even want to go there today talking about finances. This is a level two class, so you have to go into our level one BSM discipleship curriculum and go listen to Kingdom Finance, because I'm not going to talk about that anymore. But I just want you to see, that's what it's referring to. You say, I love you, and, and I, I pray God blesses you and takes care of you, and you have money in your pocket for food, and they're starving, yet you don't pull the money out and give it to them. That's what James is referring to. You don't put action behind what you say you believe. And that's what the first passage we read is talking about. That if, if you see your brother needing something and you shut up your bowels, meaning that you don't help, then how is the love of God in you? How can the love of God be shown through you if you refuse to put action behind what you say you believe? So laid down is in two different facets that reconcile in themselves. The first way is that we cease from our works as God did from His. That's the passage in Hebrews. And the other way is that we lay our will down and live sacrificially before God. But just because we rest, meaning that we do not earn it, we receive it freely, does not mean that there is not action that needs to take place. So a person that is laid down is a person that has given themselves over to the Lord sacrificially, meaning I will do whatever God tells me to do. You are now Lord of my life. I don't guide it anymore. I have laid down my own will. 
so that way you can be the thing that you are my source, you are my guidance, you are Lord. You are the one that dictates what happens moving forward. I laid my will down. But also I laid down in his presence is the way I enter into rest. Meaning that it's not that I'm not doing anything. A lot of people misunderstand this because they think that, well, I got saved, I don't have to do anything. Well, when you got saved, you still are alive. You haven't actually, you don't get saved and then two seconds later, your heart stops beating, you die and you go to heaven. And then it's it. You didn't have to do anything else. No, when you get saved, I was saved at 18 years old. It's been nine years since I was born again. And nine years later, there's still things that need to be done. You got to heal the sick, got to raise the dead, got to cast out the devils, got to cleanse the lepers, got to preach the gospel. Got, I mean, there's work to be done. But I don't do that work to get God to do things in my life. I do things because I know that He desires me. We talked about that last week in our Song of Solomon Progressions, where it says, I am my beloved's, I give myself to the Lord because His desire. Because he desires me. I am my beloved's and his desire is toward me. He enjoys me. He wants me. And this is what laid down is all about. It's the fact that I can rest in God and do things for the Lord. And I do them sacrificially because I have given myself to him. I have taken myself and placed it on the altar for him. Now this is where rest in the natural comes into place. It's not saying you know you need to go and sleep on the seventh day now you do need natural rest let me let me say this you cannot go non-stop 15 hours a day every single day and not burn out you will you need to rest you need to get sleep you need to have one day a week where you don't do anything where you just sit before the lord and read your bible and, and have an enjoyment day so many times people have a day off of work on like let's say sunday Yet, there's more shopping done on Sunday than any other day of the week. Like, why, why is everybody, like, people don't rest. There is an aspect of natural rest, meaning that you need to take time where you just relax. You don't do anything. You know, you watch a little, watch some sermons on TV, read your Bible, relax with your family. You know, just enjoy the day. You know, people back in the old days, and I say old days because I'm not that old to know it, but... They didn't do anything on Sunday. I mean, I remember Dr. Summerall used to talk about his mom that she wouldn't even cook on Sunday. She would cook enough on Saturday so that way they just had to heat the food up on Sunday. You know, it, that, there, was, there was no work at all being done because they understood that the body needs rest. But the rest that it's really referring to in Hebrews 4 is the fact that I am no longer under the old covenant. I'm no longer under the law. Because when you're under the law, you try to work to earn things from God, and that is not a place of rest. But when you realize that God gives freely, if I will just enter into that and just receive it by faith as I am connected to Him, then that is what we're talking about. That's the two aspects of being laid down. I can already tell this class is very... We're teaching it in a very different way than we taught it the very first time, so I pray... It's blessing you. If you want more information, then I encourage you to go watch the previous time we've taught this. But let's jump in again. Let's read the next one. It said, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What does the shepherd do to the sheep? Makes them lie down. It is important to see that a true loving shepherd will cause you to lie down. When we talk about being laid down, true love causes you to be laid down. It, 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 the, you, people don't rest when they don't trust, when they're not secure. We're going to talk about the security of love at the very end. 
And the security of love is what produces a laid down lovesick bride. My security and what I know God says about me and how much God loves me is what will produce re- uh, rest on the inside of my heart. But what is the revelation that David has of God? David saw God as the good shepherd that cares for the sheep. With this revelation, it allows him to be sustained by God. Goodness and mercy follows me. I dwell in the house of the Lord. It's because of who he is to me in ways that I am sustained by him. That's an important point. Laid down. I know I say this phrase, laid down, lovesick bride, and, and so many people, it's just some religious phrase, and it's there's no real implication into their life. But being laid down is very important because like David, it's how we see him and what we know that he sees about us and how he views us that causes us to be laid down. That's what the true shepherd does. He makes you to lie down. He, he causes you to enter into rest. Next passage. Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. Selah, but, God, but thou, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory and the lifter of mine head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. Selah, I laid me down and slept. I awaked, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save me. O my God, for thou hast smitten all my enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people. Selah. Now when does David write this psalm? David writes this psalm when he's he's fleeing from Absalom. This is after... Uh, This is when Absalom is chasing his father David to kill him. But why was David able to be laid down? We talked about what being laid down is, but why? His trust in the Lord allowed him to rest in the protection and in the provision of God. David said, I laid down and slept. He's got somebody chasing him to kill him, yet he is still laid down. The reason why David could lay down and rest is because of the fact that he know God you protect me it doesn't matter what the temporal circumstances say the Lord is my protection but the Lord is also my sustainment the Lord will sustain me and the Lord will protect me and because of that I can rest the, the, the circumstances of life do not dictate what I do Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ, Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Now this is at the end of Paul writing to the church of Rome, to the church at Ro- the, the Romans. It's important because Paul just went through an entire masterpiece on grace in the epistle of Romans. And at the very end of it, he says, These people lay down their own necks for me. What do we know about Priscilla and Aquila? They laid down their own will to go and minister the gospel, willing to serve God even if it meant their own necks. And that that refers to martyrdom. Meaning that somebody who has laid down has made a decision at the heart level that I'm gonna go all the way, even if it means I die for it. Now, there's some people, and I would say probably anybody that's listening to this message today, that you've been a part of this ministry for a long time. So martyrdom is not some uh, secondary, not some peripheral, it doesn't really affect me, I don't really think about it. That's that. I talk about martyrdom on a regular basis, or I m- at least mention it on a regular basis. Because this is the greatest demonstration of love that you can give back to God. That God, you gave your life for me, I'll give my life for you. But I've been in a lot of churches and a lot of ministries where I say, 
are you willing to die for it? And and people kind of sit back in their chair and they go, what do you, what, what do you, what do you mean die for it? I mean, you, you say they're going to kill me? What, what, you, you, you're saying they, I might lose my job? You know, when stuff starts to t- touch your, your money and, and your, your, your finances and your life, then it becomes a whole different story on whether you are actually committed. People can straddle the fence all day and say, I'm going all the way with God. But then the minute they get thrown in prison and they start getting whipped, it's a whole different story. Then, then they don't know if they really believe what they say they believe about it. Persecution to the point of martyrdom in the Bible is declared as what will purify the church. It will make the church white. And the reason why martyrdom makes the church white is because it's the revelation or it's the realization of the fact that this could affect me. And when it becomes a reality in your life that this could happen to you, it changes the way you act. You either are all in or you're all out. And this is one thing that Priscilla and Aquila were laid down because they had already made the decision, I'm going all the way. So let's talk about this again. Because remember, laid down love sick bride is not some religious phrase. It's not some secondary thing. It is a lifestyle and it becomes who you are. You, you become a person that is laid down. Somebody that is stepped out of the old covenant and the law and has entered into the grace of God and enters into rest. That's one. And I have an entire Sunday service on the rest of God. So if you want more on that, I encourage you to go watch that Sunday service. But so the first aspect of laid down is, well, not the first. The first aspect is sacrificial living, but the second aspect is rest. So two facets. One facet of stepping into the new covenant, out of the old covenant and resting in God. The second aspect of laying down is the decision to go all the way. Sacrificial living to the point of death. And every bit of my life being laid down is proven by what I do. A lot of people say, oh, my life is laid down for the Lord. But you don't do anything for others. You're, you're, you don't have corresponding action that proves what you say you believe. That's why we talked about James earlier. And that's why it's so important in the aspect of laid down. You don't earn anything from God. God gives everything to you freely. But because He gives it to me freely, I want to do things for Him. I want to have actions that correspond what I say I believe about this man. And that that doesn't mean I'm working to earn it, because I'm still not earning any of what God does in my life, but I'm proving what I say I believe about that man. You say you go all the way. It's not until the point where you're put in the circumstance where that becomes proven. Do you really believe what you say? Now let's talk about lovesick. Lovesick is Strong's H2470 and H160. It means to be rubbed or worn, dealing with affection. We've always de- we've defined lovesick over the past couple weeks as Pain by anything that gets in the way of love. That's Mike Bickle's definition. And then uh, having affection or adoration to the degree that it pains you to be without it. Meaning I'm, I'm so in love that being even without you separated in any way just pains my heart. Now, let's... Uh, let, let's, let's read this passage real fast. But well, let, no, let me say this. When I read that Strong's definition to be rubbed or worn, imagine a, 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 a leather coat or a leather jacket or something like that, something leather. And over time, it becomes worn, meaning that that, that nice shiny leather starts to have this kind of, um, I, I don't think texture is the right word, but you can see a, a discoloration or it, it's, it looks like it's been it's been worn down like you rub something well enough it starts to get this this wornness to it we define love sick in that way because when the love of God touches you and starts to influence your life it's like it rubs on you and what it does is it changes your nature and your character your life changes when you become lovesick because the love of God will wear on you. And that's not a bad thing. It means that it changes you. The same way calloused in the heart or a hardened heart is broken by the love of God, destroying hardness, giving you a fleshly heart. 
It's the same point. But let's read the passage. I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had withdrawn himself and was gone down. My soul failed when he spake. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. The watchmen that went about the city found me. They smote me. They wounded me. The keepers, of the, veil, the keepers of the wall took away my veil from me. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, that you tell him that I am sick of love. I'm love sick. What is thy beloved more than another beloved? O thou fairest among women. What is thy beloved more than another beloved that thou so dost charge us? It says sick of love in the King James, but in the New King James it says love sick. We use those interchangeably, but we already define love sick, affection or adoration to the degree that it makes you grieve to be without him, pain by anything that gets in the way of your love. But what does someone do who is love sick? Someone that is love sick will not be offended. We've already talked about this, so I'm just gonna briefly say it. In the Song of Solomon, the bride goes through a season of testing which she is persecuted and removed from her position in the church. That's what happens. But she cries out and says, I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved that you tell them I'm sick of love. I'm lovesick. I'm not offended. And the daughters cry back, What do you know about this man that we don't know? That's the question that they ask. You know this beloved is so far greater than all the other beloveds because you're not offended even in the midst of immense persecution. What do you know about this man? And we know that this lovesick heart of the bride comes first from a place of what he said about her in chapter 4. And then it's what she sees about him that causes her to not be offended. If you see somebody that is continually being offended or walking in offense, it's because there's a lack of the love of God in their heart. Let's keep going. But Mary stood without the spectacle weeping and as she wept she stooped down and looked in the speculacre and seeing two angels in white sitting the one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of jesus had lain and they say unto her woman why weepest thou and she said unto them because they have taken away my lord and i know not where they have laid him but when she had thus said she turned herself back and saw jesus standing and knew not that it was jesus jesus saith unto her woman why weepest thou whom seekest thou she, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Now, where, why is Mary a good example of being lovesick? This is Mary who had seven devils cast out of her. She was in pain because she was not able to be with the one in which she loved. She weeped and she was pained. She says, where have you taken him? I can't be without him. Give him to me and I will be with him. I mean, she's just pained by the thought of not being able to be with Jesus. Was Mary offended? Even after Jesus being killed on the cross, she was not offended that she drew back, but actually pressed in at a greater degree. This is very important because she didn't get offended at what took place at the cross of Calvary. It didn't cause her to draw back. She was so in love, it pushed her forward. She actually went deeper with God because of what was happening. And this is where you can see somebody that is truly lovesick versus somebody that's not. It's somebody that draws back in the face of adversity and somebody that pushes in farther and farther at a greater degree. But if you remember, it's what Jesus did for her and what he said about her that caused her to go all the way like this. I mean, Jesus performed an incredible miracle in her life by casting devils out of her. I mean, that's... When you see what God does in your life and you see his true nature and his character, it will make you lovesick. And the more you see of him, the greater degree that you have. The more you know about him, the greater degree you have. And the more you will go forward. Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. And she went and told them that had been with him, and they mourned and wept. And they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. This is the same Mary as the verse before. 
But what did she become? She became the first evangelist. She was the very first person to preach the resurrection. That's incredibly powerful. Now, I'm going to make a side note real quick. I've said this to people before that you, do, you need the baptism of the Holy Ghost before you can witness. Now, we see Mary Magdalene witnessing, yet the people didn't believe. Why? Because it's through the ministration of power and miracles is what people, it's what proves what you say. Just as a side note there, as a little, little free gold nugget. But what I want you to see is that her love sickness caused her to be the first evangelist. You know, a lot of times people say, oh, you, it's the men that run it, it's the men. And I agree with what Curry Blake said, that if you can do the job, you can do the job. I don't care if you're male or female, 15 or 50, black, white, Asian, Hispanic, that doesn't matter. The first evangelist in the Bible was a woman. It wasn't a man. That's an that's a important thing to see. But I want you to connect the fact that God moved in her life, she became lovesick, and then she was utterly hanged by the thought of, I can't be with you. And then, when she's commissioned, she goes right into preaching the word. She becomes an evangelist immediately. She goes and gives her life over to him. Now I want to talk about the bride. The bride is Strong's G3565. It's to veil as a bride, including a betrothal. Now what does it mean to be betrothed? Let me say that betrothing means that we are married, yet the marriage is not consummated. Me meaning, we are legally joined together as a married couple, yet we have not consummated the marriage. That's what a betrothal is. In Hosea 2, it's in the additional resources, it says that the Lord betrothed himself to us. We are betrothed to God. Hosea is the first prophet in the Old Testament to preach the bridegroom revelation. The fact that God is not just God to people, but he is betrothed. He is enjoined to his people as a bridegroom. The bridegroom revelation is so powerful. But that revelation of the bridegroom will produce the bridal identity. You cannot walk as a cherished bride until you realize he is a bridegroom with deep desire for relational partnership with his people. God doesn't want servants. Jesus doesn't want servants. He wants a bride. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let, that, and let him that heareth come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. This is in Revelation 22, 7. Who is the bride mentioned here? The bride is the, the bride of Christ or the church. But I want you to see that in Revelation 22, it's the spirit and the bride that cry, come Lord Jesus. It's not the spirit and the army of God. It's not the Spirit and the sons of God. Now, I believe you are a son of God. Yeah, I mean, you are a son of God. Position of power. You are a part of the armies of God. And both of those facets of who you are come from the nature of God as a king and as a judge. But it is in the fullness of time, at the very consummation of the end of the age, that Jesus isn't coming back for sons. He's coming back for a bride. Men, you are the bride of Christ. Women, you are the sons of God. These are just different facets of your identity. But when the Lord returns, He is coming back for a church that is operating in her bridal identity. And that's what Jesus is coming back for. That's why the bridegroom revelation is so important. He that had the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy here is fulfilled. Why was John the Baptist explaining here? Jesus is the bridegroom, and we are his bride. John the Baptist called himself a friend of the bridegroom. He rejoiced because the bridegroom was here, coming to find his bride. Let's go to the next one. The voice of joy and the voice of gladness and the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the voice of them that shall say, Praise the Lord of hosts, for the Lord is good and His mercy endures forever. And of them that shall bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord, for I will cause to return the captivity of the land as at the first, saith the Lord. 
What are the two reasons God will be praised? He's good, mercy endures forever. What are the two voices crying out sacrifice of praise? Jesus, the bridegroom, crying praise to the Father, and the church or his bride crying praise with Jesus to the Father. When everything is subjected under Jesus, Jesus will then turn and subject it, give it back to the Father. And he brings praise to God with his bride, the bride and the bridegroom. Last passage, and then we're going to do a little overview and we're going to have another little conversation. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise, five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, and our lamps are, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answering said, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but, rather, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And then while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready with him went into the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye neither know the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. What is the importance of this parable? The, the bride of Christ should always be re waiting for the return of the bridegroom. So let's talk about this for just a second. I'm going to overview it, and then I, I want to get into this last little revelation before we finish. You are a laid-down, lovesick bride. That is who you are to God. And we need to operate in this identity. Meaning we live sacrificially before God, no matter the circumstance, whatever it may be, all the way to the point of death. And we lay down, meaning I'm not trying to earn from God. I'm just resting in what God has already done for me and receiving freely. I'm lovesick because of what he said and what he has done for me and what I see about who he is. And I am a bride. I'm a cherished bride because he is a bridegroom with deep desire for relational partnership. He doesn't want a servant. He wants, a, he wants partnership. This is the identity of the fullness of what the church will be operating in when Jesus returns. Now, I want to go through a little lesson on security of love and then we're going to finish. We're going to do this kind of quick, so just track with me it's all in the additional resources but i'm gonna read these verses really fast for i am the lord i change not therefore ye sons of jacob are not consumed so the first one we got is the fact that god does not change revelation 1 8 i am alpha omega the beginning and the ending saith the lord which is which was and which is to come the almighty so god says first and last alpha omega if you want more information on that, just take our end times curriculum. Let me read this next one. It says, Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. I'm about to give you a point, but I'm, I'm just reading through all of these back to back real fast. Remember them which have rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Jesus the same, yesterday, today, and forever. God is not a man, and that he should lie. Neither the Son of Man, that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? One last one, and then I'm going to... I want to read all these verses. Some people don't even know that they're in the Bible, so I want to read them. And then I'm going to give you a point real fast as we get ready to finish. In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in thy righteousness. I 
I believe that's the one I was looking for. But let me let me say this. All of these verses culminate together in what we call security of love. When Jesus says, your sin has been put as far as the east is from the west, God says, I will remember them no more, meaning I'm never going to hold them against you again. And then he says, so God says, your sin is as far as the east is from the west. I will remember them no more. And then he says, the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. So if you take those three truths, this is where security comes in. God's not holding anything against me anymore. He's not taking away the things that he's giving to me. And he has put everything ungodly away from me. So it's not hindering the relationship. Now, a lot of people know those three truths. East is from the West. Remember no more. And then he says that I will not take away those things which I have given to you. People know those truths, but then it changes in their heart based on the circumstances of life because sometimes they go in a declension. It's like, uh, I mean, I didn't really do that good today. You know, maybe, maybe he is looking at my sin today or maybe he is looking at my works today. Here's something I want you to know. The Lord says, I never change. And I never break my covenants and I never lie. So when I tell you there is absolutely nothing hindering our relationship, this is where you become a laid down lovesick bride. This is what security is all about. Security and love is the realization that there's nothing hindering my relationship with God anymore. The only thing that hinders my relationship with God is me. If I don't go all the way in. But to enter into this revelation, you have to understand that God has already taken everything that hindered the relationship between you and Him and put it away from Him. It's completely gone. It's not a part of the relationship anymore. It doesn't hinder you anymore. Let me say this real quick. We, we got through this lesson a little bit quicker than I thought we were, but I'm glad we did. If you have questions, always remember to send your questions in. But I want to say this again. Laid down lovesick bride is not a, it's not some religious phrase. I don't think I've ever heard a church say it other than us. And I've only known one other person to ever say it. So it's, it's, not, it's not a religious phrase. That's not what this is. This isn't some cool little thing that you just say and you move on. No. This is who you are. This is who God expects you to be. This is what you need to be. If you ever want to enter into the fullness of God. If you ever want to enter into the fullness of everything that God has ordained for your life, if you want to experience all of God, then you must become a laid down lovesick bride. One more overview and then we're going to be done. Laid down is in two facets. The way in which we lay down our will and live sacrificially before God, even to the point of death. I'm going all the way no matter what happens next. In my time, in my money, in my life. It doesn't even matter if they kill me for it. I'm going all the way. The second way I'm laid down is the way in which I step out of the old covenant into the new covenant and I rest with God, seeing Him as my source and my provision and my protection. I don't try to earn anything. I lay myself down before Him because He is my source. Two aspects of laid down. Love sick is the way in which He sees me then I see Him that produces wholehearted radical obedience because of the fact I love him. I don't want anything getting in the way of our relationship. It pains me if anything tries to get in the way because I'm so in love with this man because I realize how much he loves me. And then I am a bride. I'm a cherished bride. And I'm a bride because he's a bridegroom. And he has deep desire for relational partnership with his people. He doesn't want me to serve him. He wants me to love him. And he wants to be in relationship with me. And he wants to do things in partnership with me. And when you enter into the fullness of this, it will change your life. We're going to stop here for today. But if you have questions, like I said, send your questions in. Father, I thank you. Bless everybody under the sound of my voice. I give you all the glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Church, I love you. God bless you. Have a good night. And we'll see you next week.